few years back, my family and I were skiing at Mission Ridge. Bomber Bowl has always been a family favorite. It was late in the afternoon, and I was annoyed that my parents wanted to stop skiing. One more run, I begged. Fine, conceded my mother. One more run, then you meet us at the, at the bottom near the lodge. Even though the sun was going down, I was sure I could make it before dark. There's something creepy about the woods when you are alone. Perhaps it's the deep shadows. It's the unseen animals lurking in the trip brush or the absence of people and lights. I pushed through my fears and continued down the hill. Suddenly I heard a sound. I told myself it was just the wind through the trees, but I'm not that convincing. The noise got louder and louder. It almost sounded like something heavy dragging on the ground through the woods. The hair on my neck stood on end as the eerie noise grew louder. I could hear it more clearly at this point, like crunching snow, breaking branches, and light metallic twangs. Blood rushed to my head and my ears rang. It was then I remembered a story my father had told me, a story no one believed, a story about, about what happened on the slope in 1944. A military B-24 Liberator heavy bomber was conducting a night training mission out of Walla Walla Army Air Base. Weather conditions were worsening, but the crew was ready to persevere. Rain and wind fervently pounded the plane, which veered them off course. A local fire watch looked out into the fog. The doomed aircraft groaned and clattered as it careened through the darkness. Moments later, they saw a fireball. The plane had succumbed to the storm. The next morning, a search party reached the mangled airplane wreckage to locate the bodies of six crew members. It was reported that there were no survivors. At least, that's what the official story was. You see, Flight 22 had been carrying top secret war documents that, under absolutely no circumstance, could be disclosed to the general public. The recovery crew was made to gather up everything of a sensitive nature, place it in the fuselage, fill it with TNT. They blew the remnants of the plane to smithereens. Despite these efforts, only five bodies were ever recovered. The tail gunner was unaccounted for. From what the rescue crew could determine, a word must have gone out from the captain to abandon ship in the moments before the crash. It appeared that the tail gunner was the only one to parachute out. From evidence gathered at the crash site, it looked like the gunner bailed out and hit the ground at the same time the B-24 made its monumental impact. Shrapnel was thrown in all directions, including the propellers. It was evident that a piece of the propeller had zigzagged at a high speed across the ground towards the gunner. Lying on the ground, entangled in his parachute, the very thing that could have saved his life could have been his death. The propeller lodged itself in the tail gunner, gouging him through the middle. By the time the rescue party found the wreckage, a pool of blood was all that remained where the tail gunner had landed. His body, the parachute, and the propeller were never found. They followed a trail of blood through the brush and deep into the woods, but couldn't recover the body. Years passed, and the catastrophe of Flight 22 faded from all the headlines. However, According to the legend, people started reporting strange sightings in and around the Wenatchee Mountains. Every now and again, a hunter would find a deer, raccoons, or other small animals partially eaten and mutilated. The bodies looked as though they had been ripped with jagged metal rather than teeth or claws. Even more strange were the claims from hikers that they had seen what appeared to be a human form in some type of metal object protruding from its side. There's no real hard evidence that these stories are anything more than outlandish tales, but they continue to persist. For many years, skiers have reported prop men sightings, including the ski patrol. They were preparing to do a training exercise on Bomber Bowl. One member was delayed because he couldn't get his boots secured into his bindings, but he said he would catch up in a few minutes. He left the ski patrol hut alone and started skiing towards Bomber Bowl. 
The wind was blowing hard. It was a cold and bitter wind that chilled you straight through, almost as if you weren't wearing a coat at all. The snow was swirling through the air and blocking any line of sight. He moved blindly through the cold before finally spotting what he thought to be the rest of his patrol down the hill. Hurrying on, he caught the group just as they were headed into the woods. He placed his hand on his patrol partner's shoulder only to recoil in horror. It was a group of cross-country skiers finishing their expedition. He asked if he had seen the rest of the patrol. One of the strangers pointed out that he could catch a spur trail just up ahead that would make, take him north to Bomber Bowl. Taking the shortcut would most likely enable him to catch up to his group, but he was reluctant. Alone in this weather, he would advise others not to go on. He had to catch up and continue the training exercise. The decision was made. As he traveled the overgrown spur trail, he thought he heard something other than the snow compressing beneath his skis. It had to be the wind, or maybe the blizzard-like snow was making him hallucinate. He pushed on, but before long, he had a sinking feeling that he was being watched. Someone, or something, was traveling parallel to his path, at the same speed and to his right. He was certain of it. If he would stop, whatever it was would stop. He'd start, and whatever it was would start. If he skied faster, it would ski faster. If he slowed down, it would slow down. Looking out to the right, all he could see was a deep and horrifying darkness. The skier began to conjure up heart-stopping images of bloodthirsty cougars, territorial bears, and the vicious Sasquatch. Sweat poured from his skin despite the chill in the air as he hurried to catch up with his group. Being alone in the woods was not good, but being lost with the mysterious noise following you was even worse. By this time, he was becoming frightened and started to ski as fast as he could. Up ahead, he could see a sharp bend in the trail to the right, and he knew he was about to face his pursuer. With his heart beating and his lungs burning, he turned the corner. A few yards down the path, through a mist of snow, he could see a dark shape. It was about as large as a cougar, but standing on two limbs like a human. Who's there? yelled the patrolman. The figure did not answer, but heaved itself closer to the man. Are you lost? He called, trying to speak with the confidence his training had instilled, but found his voice shaking. As the figure approached, the man thought he saw three arms, but one limb was jutted out and glinting moonlight off the freshly fallen snow. He skied closer to the figure, stealing himself and remembering that snowy rescues were part of the job he had been training for. I lost my group too. We could ski down the mountain together, he said. Almost in an instant, the wind calmed and the snow settled to faint flakes. The man could hear a low gargling moan, or maybe it was a growl. 20 feet in front of him, clad in tattered army overalls, stood what could only be the lost tail gunner from the doomed flight 22. A jagged and shiny metal prop was projecting from his right side. He was barefoot, with shaggy hair and a beard framing his wild eyes. For a moment, the skier stood, frozen in fear, looking into the haunted eyes of his worst nightmare. In the moonlight, it looked less like a human and more like a grotesque creature. It looked as though it could have been human at one time. Its teeth were chipped and missing with dried blood matted all over its face and in its hair. Pieces of the creature were bloated while other pieces seemed to be missing altogether. Three of its claw-like fingers were broken off in the center as if they had frozen off during long winters. Tails and skulls hung from his belt along with the military-issued canteen but perhaps the most noticeable feature about the creature 
was a massive, jagged propeller protruding from its mangled side. The patrolman opened his mouth to call out again, but only a puff of warm breath came out. The creature stared back at him as if deciding what to do. The skier was paralyzed, not knowing his fate. What was this thing? What did it want? Was he going to get out of this alive? Moments passed that felt like years before the sound of others wafted on in on the now gentle wind. The creature cocked his head unnaturally in the direction of the voices as if deciding what to do. Then, suddenly, a specter of Flight 22 vanished into the forest as if it dis disintegrated into the swirling snow. Our patrolman burst down the trail following the voice of his cohort and his new greatest fear. His ears were ringing and his sight was narrowing into the small tunnel. Somehow he found his way back to the lodge and began to cry at the warm light and smoke now rising from the chimney. As you might expect, he was incoherent and hysterical when he found the rest of his group by the fire. When he finally was able to tell his story, it was hardly believable, but it was also obvious that he had experienced something beyond traumatic in those woods. The epilogue is sad. The man could tell that the others were just appeasing him, but he knew what he saw that night. He demanded to be taken home. Shortly thereafter, he left the ski patrol and never ventured back onto the slopes. It's a pretty wild story. It's a pretty wild story. It's a pretty wild story, whether it's true or not. Whether it's true or not. Whether it's true or not. All I can say is, I wasn't going to stick around that hill and find out. I've never skied so fast in my life as I did past the strange noises and wreckage on Bomber Bowl.